Pay Attention, Carter Jones by Gary D. Schmidt, Chapter 3, The Boundary. Quote, the perimeter of the field is generally lined in white chalk, setting the limits of play within this boundary. Unquote. <clears throat> okay, so a lot of the first day of sixth grade was pretty much what I expected. All the halls had new bulletin board displays that said, Welcome back, Minutemen! And once we all got into our homerooms, the loudspeaker came on, and Vice Principal Del Blanco welcomed everyone to school like it was the best thing in the whole world. And wasn't everyone glad to be back at Longfellow Middle School? And let's all give a big Longfellow Middle School welcome to all the new 6th graders, because remember, 7th and 8th graders, you were once new 6th graders, too! Then Principal Sweet Deck came on and said she hoped we would all have a wonderful year and that she was eager to see all of us in our new classes, but she hoped she wouldn't see any of us in her office this year. This was supposed to be a principal joke. Classes weren't as bad as I thought they were going to be. I got Mr. Barkus for math skills, and he showed us how he could memorize everyone's name, nickname, and street address after hearing them only once. I got Mrs. Harknett for homeroom, and she looked like she'd be okay, mostly because she'd filled her classroom with more paperbacks than are in most libraries. The gym had that new gym smell, and it was all ready for that first squeak across the glowing floor, even though Coach Krasowska was patrolling the edges, making sure no sixth grader was stepping onto his floor wearing anything but sneakers. In the cafeteria, the lunch ladies had loaded strawberry milk into the coolers, which I'd never had before, but it seemed like a pretty good idea. In the science hall, Mrs. Rubel had arranged glass beakers next to Bunsen burners so that her class looked like Frankenstein's lab, and she told us we could try anything as long as we checked with her to make sure it wouldn't explode. Mr. Salaski told us we are now done with elementary school, and he took education seriously, and so should we. So he started right in teaching about the Boston Tea Party like he wasn't going to spend a minute not talking about American history. And I had Mrs. Harkneck for language arts, too, and she handed out textbooks that got printed, like, yesterday, so the pages were still stuck together, but they looked all right, even though they had poetry between the good parts. So, pretty much what I expected, like shedding summer all day. But there was one thing I hadn't expected. Stupid Billy Cole told everyone about the butler. Everyone in the sixth grade. All day long. It was like, you have a butler? Really? And they still make butlers? And is your butler going to carry your books to school? And does your butler open your door for you and like bow all the time? And so does your butler tuck you in at night? That last one was from stupid Billy Colt, who almost got a face full of fists until I remembered who I was and made a good decision. It helped that Vice Principal de Blanco was standing right there. But when school was finally over and I was about to leave, and it was still raining an Australian tropical thunderstorm, I looked out the sixth grade door and saw a whole crowd of sixth graders standing where the kids who get picked up stand, looking at something big and purple. Even kids who take the bus were standing there. So I walked over to the elementary building's fifth grade door, and I got Annie, and we went around to the fourth grade door and got Charlie, and then we went around to the second grade door and found Emily, and we stood there like giants around the second graders until the butler came to pick us up. My mother was in the front seat again. We all squeezed in the back. How was your first day? She said. I thought you were going to pick us up in the Jeep, I said. It's still in the shop, she said. I hope it won't be in the shop tomorrow. Young Master Jones. Carter. My name is Carter. That's Carter. So you did remember. Most gratifying. Young Master Jones. What you mean to say to your mother is, and how was your day? What I mean to say is, because your mother has had a very long one, punctuated with unfortunate mechanical news of all stripes. If you'll pardon my interruption. Of your interruption. The jeep, I said. The jeep is on its last legs, said my mother. Are you sure? The butler looked over at me. The mechanic's colloquial description of the situation was this. Quote, lady, you can stick a fork in this one and call it done. Unquote. So what are we going to do now? Carter, my mother said, let's just get home. Is the jeep dead? said Emily in that voice that tells you she's about to cry. Don't be a baby, I said. I'm not a baby, she said. Carter, said my mother with that look. So we drove home in the eggplant with the windshield wipers slumping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The only sound of the stupid purple car. When we got back home, Ned was waiting for us. And he got pretty excited again and started bouncing around on his short legs and barking his high. Where have you been, bark, until he threw up. I figured this was a good time to take my backpack upstairs, but the butler didn't think so. 
Young Master Jones, he said, and pointed. Aren't you supposed to do stuff like that? I said. On the occasion of emergency, had I been hired as your scullery maid, apparently with regularity, but I'm not your scullery maid. He handed me a roll of paper towels and a plastic bag. Usually my mother, neither is your mother a scullery maid, said the butler. So I am? For such a time as this, said the butler. I took the roll of paper towels and the plastic bag. I knelt down. It was disgusting. When I was finished, the butler handed me Ned's leash. It's raining, I said. The butler went to the mudroom, brought back his satellite disc umbrella, and handed it to me. I usually don't take Ned for walks right after school, I said. I sort of like to crash. A habit confirmed by Ned's protruding belly. Isn't it fortunate that habits may be changed with discipline? Mom, I said. Only around the block, she said. Around the block, I said. I'll be sopping wet when I get back. Annie started to laugh. By which time Miss Anne will be well into her piano patris, said the butler. I'm not taking lessons any more, she said. A loss that you and I shall amend, said the butler. Annie was no longer laughing. This isn't fair, I said. An irrelevancy, said the butler. What does that mean, I said. It means that the claim of fairness is the consistent, if unsympathetic, wine of one who lives in a republic. A monarchist such as myself recognizes the virtue of simply getting to the thing that must be done. So to it, young Master Jones. I took Ned out. The Australian tropical thunderstorm, which had thundered and stormed on and off all day, waited until we got out the door to start coming down sideways again. I didn't even try to use the satellite disc umbrella. I figured that Ned would want to get back inside anyway, so he'd only be out for like a minute, but he didn't want to go back inside. He loved it. He ran through puddles up to his belly and let his ears blow straight behind him and kept his eyes mostly closed and his nose pointed up, and he watered the azaleas in front of the Ketchum's house and the rhododendrons in front of the Briggs's house and the holly hedge in front of the rock castle's house and the petunias in front of the Kirchus's house, and then he pooped next to Billy Colt's driveway, which I figured stupid Billy Coat deserved for blabbing about the butler. Then he went again in the day lilies on the other side of Billy Coat's driveway, and then we headed back since we were both starting to shiver, and Ned couldn't have had anything left anyway after all he'd done. And when we got home, the kitchen was warm as anything. There was a rag rug on the floor for Ned and a fluffy towel waiting for me, and the butler told me to go upstairs and put on dry clothes and then come right down. So I did, and when I came back into the kitchen, there was hot chocolate chip cookies and a mug of something steaming. What's this? I said. Tea with milk and sugar said the butler. I don't drink tea, I said. All civilized people drink tea, young Master Jones. Then I guess I'm not civilized. A claim you shall share with the Vikings. Huns, assorted barbarian hordes, and marauders of all stripes, I have taken the liberty of adding more sugar than one might normally expect. I sipped at it. I sipped it again. It was pretty good. It stinks, I said. The butler sighed. There is no need to announce repeatedly how very American you are. You know, I think I might know something about this since I can remember who I am, but tell me if I'm wrong. I said, we're in America, right? I mean, I'm supposed to be American, right? The butler sighed again. I think, young Master Jones, we will need to come to an understanding. You bet, I thought. End of chapter three.